the current cloud comes. And then the next slide, when this is done, you can put some questions to the panel, which we will share and ask the English panelists to ask. My name is Mahir Nasser. I'm the director of the Outreach Division in the United Nations Department of Global Communications. And uh, I'm very privileged and honored to moderate this panel on a topic that clearly is the topic of the hour, climate change communities in action. By being here today in this panel and the session, and also as reflected in the language that I saw in the draft declaration, you're an audience that does not need an introduction to climate, to how instrumental the impact of climate change has on the future of life on Earth. And I say life on Earth because it's a detrimental impact not just for humans, but also for other species. <coughs> and the importance of climate action. The Paris Agreement in 2015 and the Sustainable Development Goals adopted by world leaders also in 2015 outlined the way forward. But as we have heard from scientists and experts, and as reiterated by Secretary General Antonio Guterres multiple times, we need to scale up the level of ambition and actions to avoid the worst case scenarios. And here I'd like to use a quote from Sergio Vieira de Mello, former High Commission of Human Rights, former UN Representative, Special Representative of Iraq. He was killed in 19 August 2003 when a terrorist and Qaeda attacked the United Nations uh, in Baghdad. Unless we aim for the seemingly unattainable, we risk settling for mediocrity. And I don't think anybody wants to settle for mediocrity. Anybody here would like to settle for mediocrity? So when we talk about raising the level of ambition for action, for determination, we should be guided by always aiming for the seemingly unattainable, because nothing is necessarily unattainable. We're less than one month away from the Secretary General's Climate Action Summit, where leaders of government, private sector, and others were invited to the United Nations by Secretary General Antonio Guterres not to come and make speeches, but to announce actions with a much greater level of ambition for climate action. Climate Action Summit 2019. A race we can win, a race we must win. We must redouble our efforts on sustainable development goals to be able to address the impact of climate change and to invigorate climate action. In line with the underlying principle of the Sustainable Development Goals of leaving no one behind, and as I heard earlier today from uh, our colleague, Ms. Williams, leaving no place behind, <coughs> climate action must be fair for all. It must support jobs and health and protect the most vulnerable. And many, if not all of these, start at the community level and local government. We have a great panel to discuss climate actions that communities and individuals can take. Before I go to the panel, I have a call to action to all of you. Four days ago, on the 23rd of August, we started at the United Nations a 30-day countdown campaign push for uh, something we started earlier in the year called Act Now. Make a difference, send a message. And you just Google Act Now hashtag climate action now and then you can join the campaign. The other point that I am happy to share with you today is an announcement made this morning at the United Nations headquarters in New York. The United Nations has opened additional space to places for civil society groups to participate in the 2019 Climate Action Summit uh, in New York on the 23rd of September. This was done in recognition of the crucial role of civil society in driving forward urgent climate action. Successful applicants 
will join global leaders in the General Assembly at United Nations headquarters in New York, as well as work group meetings across the summit's key action areas to be held on September 21st and September 22nd. These places are in addition to more than 200 invitations that were already being issued to civil society representatives, including over 100 youth representatives who were the winners of what was called the Green Tickets. More than 600 young people will also participate in the Secretary General's Youth Climate Summit at QN headquarters on September 21st. The announcement is being made in conjunction with our conference, and that was stated at the press conference this morning, the 68th United Nations Civil Society Conference being held here in Salt Lake City. UN Secretary General's envoy for Climate Action Summit, Luis Alfonso de Alba, said that the UN was responding to the overwhelming demand for increased participation from civil society, and this is in line with what we're doing here, with carbon, and I quote, with carbon pollution increasing and the global thermometer rising, we are seeing the impact of climate change getting worse every day, causing huge damage to people, communities, and ecosystems everywhere. But the movement to tackle climate change is gaining momentum as people and organizations everywhere are demanding action. The Climate Action Summit will be a moment for civil society to join with world leaders from across government and politics to push climate action into a higher gear. The voices, solutions, and engagement of civil society are more vital than ever. <coughs> civil society groups in all countries and across all fields, we are working to drive forward positive climate action and solutions are encouraged to apply for additional positions by submitting a short written submission by September 5th, and more details we will share with you on that. Now to our esteemed panel. I don't think I need to introduce you to the mayor. Mayor Jackie Skopsi, the mayor of Salt Lake City, our generous and hospitable host. Uh, next to Mayor Skopsi is John Rigo. John is the vice president for sustainability at Sony Pictures, and he will also talk about the partnership we have had with them for many, many years. Uh, John's left is Laura Logan, Logan uh, media personality, TV host, Tess, travel blogger, and environmental enthusiast. And next is Luke Mullen. You saw Luke at the opening session. Uh, environmentalist, actor, and he is in, on Disney's Candy Mac, which films here in, in Salt Lake City. And then next to Luke, you can see. Lumide Idowu, co-founder of International Climate Change Development Initiative, ICCPI Africa. And his name on Twitter is Mr. Climate. And then last but not least, Sina Nirokin, youth delegate from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Uh, and her Twitter says, small island girl with big dreams. Be bold for change. Um, I can share with you their Twitter handles and, and, and please do engage and, and do use the hashtag climate action, climate change, and of course the conference hashtag uh, as we move forward because we want this conversation to have the biggest reach and impact. So now I turn to the panel. Mayor, yeah. um, this panel is about climate change and communities in action. You have been the leader of this city and that we're also public servant in, in different capacities. Uh, maybe you want to share with us some of the things that you have put to action and some of the things that you think can still be done for communities, uh, cities, and, and, and local authorities. Thank you. All right, there we go. Um, absolutely. So, one, thank you for coming today and listening to this conversation and participating. I think this is really the issue of our time. And we know that um, this issue doesn't just stand alone, that equity is very intertwined with this discussion that we're having today. Um, for me, as a mayor, I um, have been very fortunate to be working with a group of mayors from across this country, all of whom stood up together uh, at um, 
the U.S. Conference of Mayors in 2016 when our new president had decided we were going to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement and regardless of party affiliation, the mayors had gathered very quickly and signed on to a resolution sending a clear message to the world that the U.S. was still in. And that was a very valuable moment for us as a country because what that meant is as mayors who are on the front lines of dealing with climate change and the impacts of climate change, now we're embracing the reality that we were kind of on our own and had to take action at the local level without the support of federal government. And we have that. I want you to be very clear about that. In this country, when I was um, in my 2016 year of being there, I was the 16th city in the country to commit to 100% renewable energy for my entire city. Yes. <laughs> and my team and I, uh, who some of our, I can see right here, my director of sustainability, Vicki Bennett, and Tyler Colson, who is just an amazing rock star uh, in the world of negotiations, uh, we were able to um, broker an unprecedented franchise agreement with our energy provider. And that led to enabling legislation this, that passed this year that would allow an entire community to flip a switch and go 100% renewable all at once. That enabling legislation was a very big win here in this state because we don't always align on this issue. You know, I'm a very blue community in a very red state, yet we have the support because our energy provider was standing with us. And those conversations are extremely important in order for us to be successful as a country to do our part. We absolutely must bring our energy providers with us. The other piece to that is not just the renewable energy piece, but it's also building the infrastructure so we can go electric in our vehicles. And as a community, we have been working on that and our energy provider is also doing some work there, putting in electric charging stations from Yellowstone to Disneyland and inside our national parks here so that people can actually get around using electric vehicles. But we as a city have been doing that work as well, putting in charging stations every budget cycle to make sure that they are there and working with our transit company to ensure that they are buying electric buses. And we have launched some of that work this year. So the work is very important. We have to come at this from multiple angles and every community needs to rise up and do this work. As a chair of a uh, a joint venture that the mayors have been doing for the private sector has been rewarding because we are not only measuring what's happening in cities, we are sharing best practices through that partnership. And that alliance is enabling many, many communities. So now you have well over 150 communities going 100% renewable by 2030 in the U.S. And now you have over 450 communities or cities who are doing the work that they need to do to be able to make that commitment. So we are on our way and all since 2016. Thank you, Mayor. Maybe I'll just follow up with a, just a short question. Is There are people who might argue, who argue that the way to get things done, whether in climate or whether it can be on smoking or anything else, is regulation, whether at the national or local level. And some would say, well, leave it to the private sector, they'll manage it on their own. But I'm sure there's always maybe an issue of balance, and what level of balance at the local level, and it, is it the same at the national level? You know, I would say that um, because the way power providers um, are structured in different parts of our country, we have to address this issue differently in different 
scenario. So for us, we were able to work directly with our power provider and partner and then go to the legislature for that enabling legislation as a team. In other parts of this country, though, um, energy is structured very differently, or a community controls their own power. And, and that, I think, makes it even easier, quite honestly, to go renewable. But it's not just power. You have to look at your buildings. You have to look at how buildings are being built. We, we have a, an affordable housing group here called the Give Group who built the first net zero affordable housing in our city in just the last couple years. And they shared their model with other developers. They wanted other developers to see how they did it. They didn't see it as a competing issue. They saw it as, we are in this together. We want to share what we have learned, and we want you to uh, follow our lead so that our buildings are clear. So there is a lot of policy work involved, but there is also a lot of innovation and creativity coming from the private sector that is helping us affect the change that we are looking for. And we need those partnerships. We want those partnerships and we want the ideas and we want to be able to help you promote those ideas. Thank you. So John, John, Sony, Sony Pictures. I mean, you're in the entertainment business. You know, uh, you can give a list of the films and the work, but you're the vice president for sustainability. And how and why and when did an entertainment company like Sunny create the position of VP for sustainability? And what is entailed in your work? We work with you on, on advocating, and, and you helped us reach a wide audience on issues on the UN's agenda, whether the first collaboration we had with the film Andy Birds and then the Smurfs. And now Andy Birds too, and actually now. But can you tell us more about the responsibility of entertainment companies and the industry on sustainability and on the issue of life? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for inviting us and, and having us here. Thank you, Mayor. I love, love your city. Uh, when I first came in here, I was, I was over at the Youth Hub and I learned how to salsa dance for SDG number three, which I thought was really exciting and a lot of fun to kick off the, uh, the, the, the conference. Um, I'm actually. I think the mayor is incredible, so I don't I have trouble following up on, on your great, great work. I'm actually going to, going to walk over here. I'm actually going to ask Davila to come up here and, and help me answer that question, if you don't mind. Um, I just saw Davila give her first presentation about two hours ago. It was fantastic. We were talking about very similar topics, so I thought it would be a great opportunity for her to come in. And, and uh, Davila is a student at De Montfort University in Leipzig, UK. Uh, I work in the entertainment industry, as, as you mentioned, and we talk a lot about influencers. Um, and of course, we all know we're all influencers. Take me, I'm an introvert, I like facts, um, I'd rather talk about policy and technological innovation than I would um, about many other things. Um, and yet I can influence a good number of people. I have my family, I have my community, uh, I have the work that I do, I have my friends. And that's, you know, say one to a hundred a lot of you out there influence a lot more people, say one to thousands, and that's an incredible multiplier. If you talk to marketers, that's a multiplier to be valued. And it's the same regard here within climate change as we're trying to make a difference. And as we, as we work on some of our campaigns, we think about how do you change people's behaviors? How do you get them involved in climate change? Some people change behaviors based on uh, facts. Some people change behaviors based on who they're with. Um, some people just change behaviors based on playfulness and fun. And then some change the behaviors on children and on what their children bring home and what they care about. I heard someone talk about a lot of the issues of the SDGs help define people's identity, and so change is really hard. But it's going to start somewhere. And so one of our recent campaigns, again, using Angry Birds, um, in this playful way that really appeals to the youth, to the children, um, and trying to get them engaged in what Maher was talking about before, the Act Now Bot. And I think we have a video to play it. We're all in danger! We need to put aside our differences and work together. I'm in. 
birds and the pigs from the Angry Birds movie 2 are becoming friends in the important fight against climate change to protect our planet. The United Nations has a plan to help the Earth, and they need all of our help before it's too late. The Angry Birds movie 2 is working with the United Nations on the Act Now campaign. We need you to act now. Every choice we make matters. Every action we take counts towards protecting our planet. From the food you eat to the clothes you wear. How will you fight climate change? Here are some ideas to get you started. Try to eat free meals, or eat more vegetables, nuts, and grains. I eat dirt. <laughs> Reduce your electricity use. Unplug and spend time outside. You are Give your clothes a second chance. Use old clothes for new looks. <laughs> Drive less, walk more, and take public transportation. Hey, at least we're gonna get all our steps in today. Recycle and reuse. Bring your own bags and use a reusable water bottle. We got it! Happy fall! Act now. Act now. Yeah. Act now for a happy plan. Take part in the global movement. To save our world from being destroyed. What we really need is a hero. Actually, that position's been filled. Join the angry birds to make a difference. Go to un.org slash act now today and choose your action. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Working with what we got. Unite for a world. Now the campaign works off. <laughs> the campaign works off the theme that uh, angry birds and these green piggies. I need to say piggy at a UN event. But the green <laughs> green piggies are arch enemies of anybody who's played the game. Well, in this movie, they have to come together to defeat a, a larger force and a larger foe. A lot like what we all need to do in order to combat climate change. So I'm going to turn it over to Nabila now to take you through the campaign. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to say. I just want to say I'm really excited to be here and have this opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, so please bear with me. Um, so what I'd like you all to do now is if you could take out your mobile phones, and we're all going to join the movement together, we're going to act now together. So if you could grab your mobile phones, and I'd like you to search up un.org forward slash um, act now. So if you could do that for me, please. changes can actually go a long way in us um, attacking the climate crisis that we've got right now. Um, and what we're all going to do is, uh, when we registered, we were all given a really nice, beautiful bottle. So we're going to act now and we're going to log an action to use our refillable, nice, beautiful little bottle that we got from the UN. So if you scroll down to um, the little tab that says refill and reuse, and just for argument's sake, we're going to say, tell me more. If you're not convinced yet as to why we need to refill and reuse our bottles, so you press tell me more. And the bot generates some information and statistics just to let you know why we need to do this. Um, and currently, one million plastic bottles are purchased every minute and discarded, adding to over 300 million tons of plastic waste um, that pollutes our environment every year. And so this is why we need to refill and reuse our bottles. It's a small change that we can incorporate into our lives, but it's fairly effective. So if you just press act now, you've loved your action and you've worked together to attack the climate change. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. And just a question, John. How much did the UN pay you for this film? Oh my goodness, we're getting into that. <laughs> uh, we do this, obviously, as uh, a partner of the UN and simply in, in acknowledgement that we all need to contribute and make a difference. And this is one of the ways we contribute. We have lots of plans around our operations, renewable energy, uh, materials, procurement, um, but we, we are uh, uh, just pleased to be working in partnership with the UN, and so obviously do this as a, as a partner. Thank you. Thank you for that. That means nothing. And that's an example of another action that companies that are in entertainment and otherwise can also do. So, Laura, 
they both spoke about influencers and also the role of when you have a, when you become more than just a private person and, and you have a much wider platform. You have chosen to be an environmentalist, and I know that uh, you want to come here and, and, and give your statement. Thank you, so, Mario. Yes. I'm a little tall, so. First of all, hello, dear major of Salt Lake City. I feel like at home. Thank you for everything today. Excellencies, fellow youth, ladies and gentlemen. Buenas tardes, hola. Hola. <laughs> My name is Laura Tobon. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. Yeah. And it is such an honor to be here today. My home is burning. Did you know your home is burning too? For the last few weeks, the Amazon rainforest has been on fire. 20% of the oxygen we breathe is thanks to the Amazon. 34 million people, including 500 indigenous tribes, live in the lungs of the earth. No one knew this. For over 16 days, and our animals and our trees have been turning into dust. I'm not an expert, I'm not a scientist, I have no political power, but what I do have is the willingness to use my social platform for good. I have always worked in the entertainment business, one that seems very far away from scenario like this. My social media community is mostly young women and girls who are leaders, who are independent, empowered. I want them to think and feel they can do anything if they decide to. I know they're watching and I don't take that lightly. I am here because of them. I knew climate change was there. Even though we're suffering the consequences, it felt a bit distant. However, one day, I woke up in a city of crisis. My hometown, Bogota, was so polluted that the government had to declare a state of emergency. For a day, we were not allowed to use our cars because the air was practically unbreathable. It felt thick. Massive gray clouds were floating upon us. I started questioning myself. As a young person, what can I do to help? Along with my family, we created Etica Verde Foundation, a nonprofit organization that contributes to the conservation of the cloud forest, also called water forest, in the Andean region of Colombia. The specific kind of forest plays a big role in the rain process, something that we have forgotten, just like the Amazon. Only 1% of the global woodland consists of cloud forests, but unfortunately, its existence has been threatened by mining and climate change. Besides my nonprofit, I understood that it was not enough, that I needed to adopt a more healthy lifestyle, a lifestyle that is more in line with sustainability and environmental protection. I decided to become more aware of my waste, more conscious about my decisions. Sadly, most of our everyday products are made out of plastic, in harming processes involving fossil carbon that takes hundreds of years to decompose. I decided to ban single plastic use, reusing my water bottle and taking plastic straws from my life completely. Livestock production represents high levels of carbon emission and increased deforestation. I changed my diet. I reduced the intake of red meat and dairy and migrated to a more sustainable way of eating, consuming local vegetables and fruits. But is it enough? Probably not. But that answer could completely change if millions of us we're doing it systematically. Every single action counts. 
Maybe for you the change begins with a creating a nonprofit, as it did for me. Maybe it's carrying your bottled water everywhere and walking to work to reduce your carbon foot footprint. Maybe it's changing from a plastic toothbrush to one of a bamboo. It gives me such hope that young people in this conference are pledging to end the climate crisis in the Salt Lake City Youth Climate Compact. It will serve a bedrock for the upcoming Climate Action Summit. And here is my climate pledge for you all. I came here to learn and to share with my Latin American community your amazing initiative. I want to show everyone what you are doing. We need to get information flowing. I wanted to offer my platform to communicate specific solutions because we have the responsibility to heal the world. Thank you so much. Gracias a todos. examples of what individuals can do as also young people. One of the things that I wanted to ask about is also young people aren't always participating in political processes. Uh, if you look at participation in the election and in, in, in democratic processes, you see that usually old people vote more high percentage than young people. And that maybe also maybe part of the responsibility to maybe reflect some of that. I think young people don't know what to do in this situation. I think they're pretty lost. And you know, I have to be completely honest. At some point, I was totally lost too. I didn't know what to do. What can I do to help? Do I have to be in a political charge? Do I have to be in a social organization? What can I do? And this is what social media is about. This is what influencers are about. Luke and I, being public figures, we have the responsibility to tell all of our followers, all of the people that just are passionate about what we do, we have the responsibility to tell them that they can do something else about the plastics, about the meat, about the re recycling. There's so many things they can do. So I think nowadays, these kind of spaces, they are amazing. Thank you so much for having us. I mean, it's the first time I think uh, Colombia is having this crisis. And right now, I'm like begging you to help us. Please donate the Amazon. We're in a middle crisis right now. Everybody's like obsessed because the oxygen we breathe right now is that oxygen that comes from the Amazon. So thank you, Mayer, so much for this invitation. I hope everybody can look around what's going on right now at the Amazon in Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia. It's a terrible thing. And I know we as the influencers can do something about it. So please, let's act now. Thank you. So Luke, you spoke, you spoke yesterday at the opening session and, and we had a brief chat. And, I mean, you're, you're still in high school, uh, you're an actor, uh, and, and now you're getting on the world stage. Uh, what got you interested and how did you become a climate activist as you describe yourself? And, and, and what message do you give to fellow actors or people from a similar position that can, can definitely influence more than just their immediate family and, well, thank you um, for letting me be a part of this panel. I'm really honored to be here with you guys. Um, climate change, or as it should be referred to, the climate crisis, uh, affects us all, but it's really the young generation that we are going to see the biggest effects of climate change. Obviously, we're already seeing some of the effects now, but it's only going to worsen if we don't take action. I think a lot of us are in this uh, paralysis. We don't know what to do, and I think a lot of times it feels really daunting just reading the news articles. I know for me, I sometimes, 
I can't handle watching the news and uh, I care so strongly about this. So having a platform uh, has really allowed me to connect with this younger generation who are in the same paralysis. Um, we, you know, we don't know what to do. So what I have tried to do is use my platform to tailor awareness and tailor these messages um, to the younger generation to tell them what, what we can do. You know, I, climate change is the defining issue of our generation. And to answer your question, that's, that's, you don't have to be educated to take an interest in this. You know, I, I read one news article and I was hooked. I, I realized this was the biggest issue that I have to be a part of. I have to do everything possible to be a part of this. So um, having the platform, it's allowed me the opportunity to outreach and to um, really connect with the younger generation who are asking, what should I be doing? So what I've tried to do is I've tried to give a list of what we can do. Um, we can give up heat. We can reduce our plastic. We can drive less. Um, you know, there, there's so much that we can do. But this generation, this new generation, my generation, we are getting so involved and this movement is growing. Um, and really we're going to, we're going to be out there doing this with or without your help. We really need your help, but we're going to be out there with or without it. So I, I think that if we can all come together, not just the youth, I don't want to just say this is a youth issue. I want to say this is everyone's issue. And um, obviously this movement is focused uh, mainly on youth and especially the youth summit that is happening in September is so important. But that's what's important about it, is that we can all come together to create these solutions. So, uh, also to answer the question, being an actor in the entertainment industry, um, I think we have a great way to reach a larger portion of people that might not have taken interest in this issue. Uh, and it is a responsibility. I think if you have a platform, you have to come to it. We have to come together right now. This is the defining moment of our generation. So I'm trying to do everything I can but I don't know if it's enough, but that isn't stopping me and it shouldn't stop you. I know it's very daunting, but if you have a platform and I, I know that a lot of uh, my friends are taking interest in it now as well, um, I think that's what we have to do. We have to do everything we can because there is no, there's no wrong answer here. The right answer is we have to come together and make change. And that's what we've been doing. And I think social media is a great way uh, to make change. We, we've seen that these these strikes, these school strikes, they've been spread all across social media. And I've tried to, um, you know, spread my support of it, enjoying some of these strikes. But they're making real, real impacts. You know, in Germany, they just they said that the, they're cutting out all the coal in the next 20 years. And in Germany, we've seen a strike, or, sorry, a spike of these strikes. Um, so you can see this correlation between this youth um, motivation, this youth um, really fear of what for their future. But um, as I said before, there's no wrong answer. We have to come together now, and every tool, such as social media, can be used um, to bring people together. So if you have a platform, please use it. And anything that we are saying on our platforms, um, please listen to. Um, just, you know, there's so much we can do right now, but the main thing we have to do is come together to form these solutions and create individual actions that uh, make a real impact. Thank you. Thank you. When I was looking at the word cloud, the word that was in the middle, that I think you contributed was education. And yet, when young people, and this started the uh, Fred Thunberg in Sweden and many followed, what they decided to do was go and strike from school. And can you maybe comment on that? And education, but what kind of education, right? Um, I was given the opportunity to take uh, uh, an age class, AP Environmental Science, in my freshman year. And I think that really opened up a lot of. Uh, 
new ways of looking at this climate crisis. I think education is one of the most important ways alongside outreach through uh, social media. I think it's one of the greatest ways that our, our generation is learning about what is truly happening out there. So along the lines of the strike, I do believe that the strikes for their climate are just as important as education. Why should we, you know, be studying and preparing for a future that might not come? So that is why uh, Greta's message is so important. Why are we, you know, sitting in a classroom preparing the next 12 years of our lives when in 11 years it may come uh, to an end? So, but uh, really, I think that joining these strikes along with education, I think these can happen simultaneously. I don't think it has to be one education, one strike. I think these can happen simultaneously so we learn what is happening, but we also implement change. So we also are out there striking and we're out there fighting for our future that we learned about in class. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just want to thank Scott Carlin for actually putting together this uh, incredible panel, but also to make sure that on the panel we're not only people from uh, North America and South America, but also from other continents. And also that this is a global issue. So we have Olenege, who's in Nigeria, and he created and co-founder of the International Climate Change Development Initiative. And what we also must recognize and realize that according to UN reports is that the biggest impact of climate is on countries and people who have not been part of the problem because they are still developing economies and, and not they did not contribute to the carbon emissions and methane emissions and all the things that have said. So tell us about the work and how you got into this and, and, and what are you, you your suggested actions that we can take from, from this time as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, the mayor. Thanks for Thanks to the United Nations, thanks to my colleague and to everybody. Yeah, let me start by saying that climate change uh, is a time bomb. And if we don't take urgent action, um, every one of us will take the part. I'm from Africa, I'm from Nigeria, and I'm very, very sure everybody knows Nigeria. Um, let's start talking about the very big issue we're having from the northern part, which is the desert improvement. We have some parts of the country that are facing the oil spillage. We have some parts of the country that are facing the flooding and the waste management. I can tell you today that um, most especially when people talk about education and climate change, I always tell people that even some of us don't know what climate change is all about. So how do you want to tell people to take action? So it's, uh, my, my, my contribution or my conclusion is that we need to start going local. We need to start doing a lot of um, on ground work to let people understand that this issue of climate change, I don't tell people about climate, I tell them about environmental problem. From there, it's not helping them to understand the word climate change. And from the question you asked how I started, I think I just um, have this interest in environmental issues. I remember back then when I was in university, I don't know whether anybody knows the organization called ISEC. I was a uh, um, founding uh, coordinator in my university, whereby all we do is just to see how we can how we can make people understand that they, also, they can also do something for themselves. Um, my point was to talk about environmental issues, and that's how I started. Uh, but my point now today is that from 2011 up to now, everything I've been doing has been telling everybody about the impact. What are the things that you need to do to make sure you get all this? A lot of things are happening in the world. A lot of things are going on everywhere. We can see that if you look at climate change and conflicts, can talk more about that in my country. You see where the kidnap of the earth, the eggs men, a lot of those things are happening. And I brought down that to uh, the political issues, climate politics. We need to also look into our leaders when you sign an agreement in also countries you go to, you come back home, but you don't implement those agreements. That is another problem. And those things are things that people will be looking forward to to make you accountable. And we we'll talk about accountability and transparency. When you look at climate change issues in the country, it's something that's very, very powerful. And we, start, we need to start looking at how can I take my own responsibility? 
by adding that little value that can change things. Uh, one of the uh, things I tell people to do is to start looking at how you can tell the next person in that beside you. That that's such a thing that you throw out. Do you know what's going to cost you in the next 10 years? Start telling people, what do you think is going to happen to you when you throw that plastic bottle away? What What's going to happen to you when you start wasting food? That's another thing that people don't need to look into. Like in this country, go back to the uh, where we just finished uh, lunch, you see a lot of waste. I don't know what's going to happen to those waste, but the bottom line is that we need to start taking action whereby everybody needs to understand that climate change is real. Like I said when I started, it's a time bomb. We, are, we just see Amazon. I give you, in the next couple of months, we start seeing a lot of issues that start coming up. And when this thing starts escalating, none of us know where to run to. We start seeing that that they have in effect. So I urge you, everybody, let us start telling ourselves, let's tell our neighbor, let us make them to understand that the issue of climate change is not about talking, but about taking action. About telling everybody, you don't need to go far, start from your immediate family, start from your friends, they will be able to make more impact. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, I mean, you, you describe yourself as uh, somebody engaged in social storytelling, and I think we heard in the previous panels that facts don't always change people's minds. I have actually seen research that stories do, that many people, and, and, and how can we use, better use storytelling to impact and influence the issues that we think are important? So let me quickly give you a very uh, how what we started doing when we started doing it. So then, I don't know whether anybody knows what they call Climate Wednesday. So we decided to use this platform to make young people to, you know, uh, talk about what they feel and what they think they want to change. And we started using that as a, a impact conversation. We started using it as making people to understand that. Uh, I'm not only talking about young people, I'm talking about everybody because the platform it makes everybody to express their words, what they want people to listen to. And when you look at storytelling, there are different kind of platforms you can use to tell a story. Uh, I tell people that one minute video can change people's uh, their life. Like the video we just finished, like the one we watched just now. You can see, I was just telling them now that, like, like seriously, we're supposed to be in this video so that we can tell more stories. You know? So it's something that uh, we, every one of us needs to start doing. Look at the journalists, they are doing fantastic work by telling the world the problems that we are facing. They are telling the world how we can also change our mind towards the issue of climate change. So, storytelling is a very big uh, uh, tool where we, uh, we can use to uh, make impacts and we can also use it to, you know, to account for our, you know, uh, to do uh, transparency and accountability towards our politicians. Because they, are, because they are decision makers, we need to let them understand that things are actually happening on the ground. And uh, I will stop by saying, you know, when two elephants are fighting, is the class that suffer. So we are the class now, and those people are just there spending, enjoying, and making things for them. So storytelling, by the time they see it in pictures, in cartoons, they'll be able to understand that actually this guy that is there for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so is from the Marshall Islands, and for those of you who follow the climate debate, and, and know that small island states member states in the United Nations are some of the most active on this issue because it is an issue of survival, it is detrimental to their future. Should sea levels rise and the projections are, if we continue on this trajectory, they will. Some of those countries will no longer exist. So Serena, your young delegate, youth delegate to the UN, uh, and, and you have been involved in preparations for the Climate Action Summit, I believe. So maybe tell us a little bit how what got you into this uh, small island girl with big dreams and, and how can other people follow you? So, you want to come here? Please. Hawaii 
and Australia. And many of the islands are not even a meter above sea level. Allow me to set the tone. If the world continues at the rate that it is going, with all the carbon emissions that we are emitting, we have only 11 years left till we surpass the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. For those who do not know, this number is the number that island nations fought so hard as we are in the forefront of this existential crisis to be in the Paris Agreement that happened back in 2015. Anything beyond this number is too dire for our homes. I mean, not that it already isn't. When I first started talking about climate change at the age of 17, I would say 2050 is the year scientists predicted that my home would disappear. It is 2019 now, plus the 11 years. That is 2030. 2030. Please take a moment to absorb these numbers. Two decades less is what we have. Growing up on the islands, it is inevitable that your house would be just steps away from the water. I would find myself standing in the middle of the road, and I see the ocean, and I see the lagoon on either side of me. And I grew up with my grandparents witnessing every year king tide seasons that caused water inundations to rush through the island. Houses, graves, and seawalls were broken. Sea walls that were to be built again as soon as the tides were low. Couple days later, you see the vegetation on the island turn brown, dying. The salt water had ruined the already poor soil. There were times I woke up with water gushing into my room. I zapped away taking the blanket I shared with my siblings on the floor and put it on the laundry baskets along with our school supplies that we had left on the floor. We once had rented a hotel room as we were advised to go inland and on higher ground. My grandfather sent us kids with our grandmother because he wanted to stay behind to ensure that nothing happened to the house. How he was going to do that with the incoming waves? Thank you, Mom. A few years back, Mama, the kids, and I had to go sleep at the Mormon church because we had been born in the radio of higher flooding. This is a really dramatic picture, but I remember looking back at our house with no lights on, covered in the shadows of the night, my tears overflowing in my eyes as I fought the urge to break down. God, is this part of this? Will it hurt this much when we might have to leave forever? What to do, Father? I was unable to sleep that night. If I was determined before, I was more resolute that I will communicate this throughout the world for home needs saving. We are saving it, and the world, you inside this room, are obligated to help us as well. I am not alone as a climate warrior. All across the Pacific, climate warriors have mobilized themselves on the grassroots and an international stage to ensure our needs are heard and catered to action. When I went home during the summer of 2016, I went on a trip with the Marine I Marshall Islands Marine Resources and Authority team to collaborate with locals, religious, and traditional leaders of the Atala Pagoda. In the neighboring islands, they retain the traditional ways of living. They live with their environment. We asked what changes they notice in their environment, what fishes are no longer abundant, are they receiving as much rain, and what time of year is this and that supposed to happen? The Nimura team makes regular trips to neighboring islands throughout the year to take note of the changes, help explain to be 
these people why it might be because majority of the neighboring islands do not have access to the internet and getting cellular signal is very difficult. I remember at one point I was visiting another island and to call my family, I had to ask one of the men to climb a coconut tree by the ocean side, holding my phone up just to get signal. It is also here I noticed batteries of solar panels discarded on the beach and around the island. The Marshall Islands, while groundbreaking and solarizing all the neighboring islands, we had overlooked what we do with the batteries after they are used up. The elders shared they do not know how to properly dispose of them. And us in the capital island do not have the technology to do so. It is through working with local leaders these on those on the ground that we really see the loopholes, what is and what is not being addressed. Because, the, me, because there is only so much that we can do. While steps are being taken with local governments, traditional and religious leaders, there is more that our country needs to do. We struggle with implementing, and a big part of that is we do not have all the resources, nor do we have the expertise. So sharing planning expertise would really help us a lot. We have plans on expanding and raising the islands. We have a mountain of trash that many are saying is now the highest point in the Marshall Islands that we are still trying to figure out what to do with. Like many vulnerable communities and nations, we are a resilient lot. We are empowered to act for the best of our people and for the best of the world. We are seeing and experiencing the consequences of climate change and other environmental issues, and we act. Along with you, and along with the rest of the world. Thank you, and for more love. Thank, thank you, Sylvia. That would be an eyewitness account from a nation or people directly impacted in a way that you probably have not envisaged. Uh, Selena, what would you like to see as actions adopted or presented? You can use the microphone uh, at the Climate Action Summit next week that addresses plight of small island sites and islands. Like many of my colleagues of stage have shared, there are so many individual actions that we can take, but then in the end, the action needs to come from up there. The leaders <laughs> the one percentage or maybe even less than one percentage of the people who hold the power, the influence, and the money in the world. The action needs to come from them. And this question was asked previously in another conference, and I had said, what we need and what we demand is only out there. The solutions are there. You will see all the youths that are being mobilized all over the world, and they are demanding that this be done and that be done. It's already there. The action just needs to come from there. And I encourage that we demand that our leaders be bold, be ambitious. They already have solutions that they put out, but they're not that ambitious enough. It is really not enough. At least in my case, in my country's case, the case, and the island nation's case, and the other vulnerable nations and communities. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I see tons of questions going up the screen, but I actually wanted to give the opportunity first to you and the audience. There are two microphones lined up here. If you want to ask a question, please take your place and then take a couple of questions and then we'll have some comments. Uh, and then if you don't want to ask questions on the floor, I'll, I'll read questions from the panel from the, from the screen. So we'll start with the right side here. Please introduce yourself and be brief if you want. Thanks. Okay, um, hi, my name is Ken Nelson. Yeah, 
Cast Now campaign is cool, but it focuses too much on individual action. What is SOMI doing to combat the climate crisis? I have a couple of suggestions. Perhaps you could donate to helping extinguish the Amazon fires. I mean, it'd probably distract people from Spider-Man. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take a question from the other side, and we'll get to them. Please. Hi, my name is Denise Demink, and Mayor Lukskritsky, I hope I pronounced that correctly, I wish you were running again. Thank you for fighting the inland port pollution. <laughs> Secondly, I run a school of permaculture. When I learned how simple it is to just understand that the life support system of this planet, the way it was designed, is so perfect, it controls the cooling mechanisms of the planet, it controls the hydrology cycle, all the science is there in every country. It's there. Why then are we not learning this at universities? We need to teach how to put ecosystems back together. Small projects, the UN has spoken, the Greta has spoken to the man who planted a thousand uh, million trees. So many people in the Amazon, a couple planted two million trees all by themselves in the land they owned. What it does is it brings back 25% more rain. They've done it in Indonesia, but we've clear cut it all their course for our palm oil, which is in all our products here in America. All of us can stop buying products. You have more power to shut down a corporation with your purse than anybody else. Don't buy the products. Just like the vehicles. But Mayor, I've had a heck of a time running to my charge station because there aren't enough in Salt Lake. We are so limited. And the Transportation Department and the Sustainability Department of Salt Lake City has not been much help to us, though we are the pioneers driving electric cars, trying not to pollute the air, trying to make a difference, inviting all our friends on our platforms. Please help us to connect more with you. May I have an appointment with you before you leave office? Thank you. <laughs> One, Okay, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, the city is kind of on our own uh, doing the infrastructure for the charging stations, and I, I'm getting it in my budget as quickly as I can. But we are also trying to make sure that we are providing more transit opportunities than what was previous to my administration. That is now happening. We find, you know, that was launched just this month. High frequency routes, buses that are electric, things that have not existed in our city before. So we're moving as quickly as we can as a small individual community. But we're also bringing other communities along with us. And you see changes happening in Park City and Summit County and Moab and others that you will see in the near future doing this work as well. So. We're trying to help, and my team has been educating different cities all along the way and bringing them into the room to have these discussions because they don't have experts like we do. And the state government is not involved, so we are working as fast as we can. The state is now doing some things this year that are really uh, new to us, and we're excited about that. But these charging station ideas, that's not part of what will be happening. So we have a lot of work to do. There's no doubt about it. But we are leading and we have partners that are joining the force. And what is going to be happening in Utah over the next year is unheard of in the entire country. And you will see that by the end of 2019. So we're very excited about what's happening in Uvalde. But we do have a long way to go. And I will challenge everyone in this room if you heard the, the water bottle or the plastic bottle comment, challenge yourself to stop buying plastic bottles and products inside of plastic bottles. You can do it, and we need you to do it. And it is a very simple thing that all of us can take action on. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, in 2010, Sony launched something called the Road to Zero. Uh, it's a plan that actually gets us to a zero environmental footprint by 2050. We were one of the first corporations to have be approved by the science-based goals uh, organization. 
which requires us every five years to relook at our, our objectives, our targets, our goals, and realign them with science. Everything for us is very much based on the most recent research that's coming out of the UN, uh, IPCC reports, UNFCCC, uh, and focuses on all across, across all of our phases of our operations, from procurement, supply chain, site operations, design and production of our, our products, take back of our products and our responsibility and our uh, relationship with our consumers to also help them become more sustainable. Happy to talk about it further at a later point. One of our real focuses right now is renewable energy, part of the RE100 uh, group, and really believe that one of the best things which all of us can do is look at our energy footprint and proceed as quickly as possible on our Thank you, Amy John. Uh, we'll take, we'll take a few, few more questions. Uh, please start. Uh, my name is Nelvin Hamlin. I'm 20 and I'm going to Weber State here in Austin. Woo I was just wondering, I'm really interested in climate science. I want to go into that for my career and I've been involved in several environmental issues throughout my life. Um, but I've always encountered the same question where people would rather focus on their preconceived notions about climate change rather than the actual facts or anything behind that. Do you think that there's a way we can convince them of the actual dangers of this in a non-combative way, or is the only way to kind of be like, hey, here's what's happening, here are the issues, this is what we need to be doing, something like that. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions in the world. Hi, uh, please. Um, my name is Shola Rodi, and I'm an MBA student at NYU New York. I'm happy with a few questions on climate change. There's actually a recent report that um, uh, the poorest um, are likely, likely to face a big disaster um, in the unforeseen, um, unforeseen climate change issues in the future that we're yet to see. So I'd like to know um, what the climate change leaders um, are doing, what are the um, response in place um, as against um, unforeseen um, climate disaster that we're yet to see. Countries like Haiti, Nigeria, Philippines, are who are kind of terrorized with uh, different uh, disaster in terms of mismanagement, corruptions. Um, don't, I mean, the poor are likely to suffer major um, of all these um, um, changes that we are yet to see. So I'd like to see what climate change leaders are doing um, as a result and, and also what they're putting in place in response to what we are yet to see to come um, as a result of um, um, changes in climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take it? First one, who, please. Okay. Uh, let me let me uh, let me start from now. Sure. Okay. So just a little contribution I have on is uh, I think one of the ways we need to start telling people. You no, know, I'm not a scientist, but uh, I think we need to go local, like I said. Uh, it's something that we need to start using what we have in our community to explain to people the impact of climate change. With that, people will be able to understand. But because by the time you start telling them the big words, they will not be able to comprehend it. They will not even understand what you're talking about. So, uh, and every individual how the way they learn and how they uh, adopt everything they tell them. So, it's better for us to start looking at how we can tell them using our own, you know, our local resources to, to talk to them. And let me quickly go back to uh, my brother from Nigeria. I want to use a very good example. I've, I started going to COP, I know it has been long I've been going to COP. And I want to talk particularly about the NGCs. If you look at Nigerian NGC, I was, I'm privileged to also go through both the NGC implementation and even linking up to the green bond. If you look back very well, our thematic area we talked about uh, transportation, we talk about renewable energy. But what has been happening to our indices? Nothing. If you look at that, you'll be able to understand that we've been ready for the impact of what is going to happen in the future. It's something that is a question to our leaders. Like my sister said, they have much work to do. So my question back to you is that we need to start uh, telling our leaders, forcing them to start implementing those ideas, start implementing those so-called Paris Agreement they signed to some of them sign this agreement and not even put back home. So it's high time for us as young people, as civil society, as individually, let's start telling them it is high time we need to change this idea of 
you being signing a document and not even implementing it back home. So it's something that is eating deep into the system, and we need to talk about it now. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to answer a friend's question from this side. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what you meant by preconceived notion, but um, just an example from the Marshall Islands, what is being done, what is, what is happening there is we have, um, even with the effects of climate change that we are facing, we have people who do not believe in climate change. And what we always encourage is to localize the language, speak in the language that they would, would be able to relate to more. So for example, our religious, because the Marshall Islands is extremely religious, and when we see all these things that are happening around us, it reminds us the, of the book of Revelation, the, all the bad things that are gonna happen when the world is coming to an end. And so our people see what is happening and they think, okay, the world is coming to an end, the solution to this is to turn to God and give our lives to Him so we can live in paradise. So how we communicate with it, because most often sci uh, science denies what religion is saying and religion denies science. And so we speak to them with Bible scriptures. We say, why did God, uh, God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Was it to destroy it or to protect it? And so when you give these examples and we speak with them in, in stories and um, words that they'll be able to understand, it hits them more than me just going and spouting all these data and numbers that scientists are putting out. And so it makes them act more because that's where they are bound to and they relate to more. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that is out there uh, there is information that is being tracked all over the world. So regardless of where you are from, there is data. But specifically in Utah, there is a network of people who are working together um, and they are collecting this data regularly and updating it. And you're welcome to reach out to my Department of Sustainability to find more information about that. But in Utah, we are warming at twice the global rate. We lose snowpack every year. In the last 20 years, we've lost five weeks of snowpack. Snowpack is our water, it is our resource, it's our aquifer. And I have a city of 220,000 people, but I'm responsible for giving and providing water for over a million people. So imagine how I feel as a mayor, as I'm watching what's happening in our snowpack just in the last two decades. Things are moving very quickly. We, we have people who wanna challenge the notion, but you can see what is happening with our water and the cost of water. You can see what's happening in our snowpack. You can see it in our air. If they don't believe climate change is happening, they certainly can believe that our air is making it hard to breathe. The same things that are causing climate change are creating our air pollution. So for us in Utah, there isn't time for the naysayer. We absolutely all know we need to clear the air. It is the same issues that need to be addressed. Thank you, Mary. I just may want to talk to you about from, from what we know, the science is clear. I don't think that the so-called scientists are divided when half a percent is saying one thing and 95.5 percent is saying another. If you want to side with the half percent, good luck to you. We accept science when it creates something that's useful, and this is the creation of science. But the science and the data that shows that the emissions and the carbon concentration in the air is the highest it has ever been since the industrial revolution started, and we have ways to measure that. And I think we have to believe in, in the science that got us here as humanity that is telling us we need to take action. And action is possible, and I give you the example of the ozone layer. In the early 80s, everybody was worried about the ozone layer and the ozone wall that is growing and that we do. We're all gonna get skin cancer and there's no solution because we need the aerosols, we need the hydrofluorocarbons used in refrigeration and the rest of it. But then there was the Kyoto Protocol, the, the Montreal Protocols, 
and member states and the industry got together in the mid-80s and they signed those protocols. And today, science is telling us the ozone wall is healing. And that was concerted action that combined regulation by governments and follow up by industry and by scientists who identified alternative substances. And then we know renewable energy is the alternative to fossil fuel. So we have examples to follow and we have success stories. So I think to say that we're doomed is, is an invitation to uh, accept the worst case scenario. And I don't think, as I said, we don't settle for mediocrity, we shouldn't settle for mediocrity. Let's, let's give you all the floor, but if you can be brief, tell the question, and because I know I'm conscious we only have nine minutes left and, and we don't want to spill over. So quickly, one and one, and then we'll take you all, and then we'll, we'll see if we can take you all. Please. <laughs> yes, hi, my name is Chris Newhart. I'm a journalist and aspiring social media influencer, and this question is to anyone that wants to answer it. Um, what's some advice that you would give to people that are trying to follow your footsteps and be more consciously aware of what we post and hashtag and geotag? You know, so many social media influencers always post about what they're wearing or where they're at. You know, uh, what's some advice that you can give for us to post things that are more meaningful and help, you know, get those uh, messages out? Um, thank okay. you. Thank you. Please. So my name is Chase Megan, a member of the Minnesota Committee for the City of the Society Conference. I'm also a climate reality leader and the founder of Partner Africa. Uh, I like to comment on the influencers. Uh, majorly, one of the tools of the Facebook about is the Climate Wednesday, where this tool for Twitter has been able to really relate people to understand why they should be involved in climate issues. After all, when we did our climate reality lead, uh, leadership training, we saw the need to connect climate with menstrual health, where we can provide eco-friendly sanitary pads for people who don't have access to it. And I see that we major need to work with the mayor of Salt Lake City to see what we can do in that line of making sure women menstrual health are taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Please. I have um, one question for Luke, but before anything happens, and Mayor Piscirsky can also chime in. I just want to say that the United States, and Utah in particular, is still and always will be um, strong because of our immigrants. So I know many of you are here from nations that may be in trouble. Um, and just know that if worse comes to worse, our doors are open. Um, and one question for Luke, just that um, it's really hard to get over the apathy. Um, when our president has pulled out the Paris Climate Accord, what do you do personally to overcome that? Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yes, my name is Chun. I'm coming with the Association of Raw Citizens. I'm honored to be here and very happy here. And just act right now, please say hi. Or I love you to each other, please. Right now, please. One, two, three. Love I love you. Thank you. Oh, yes. So this, this message to give you all, and then I would like to ask how about this um, promoting of pure heart with love to the, the whole world and Bible individual individual thing is go through our government and go through our any men every offices many any places so it's very very quickly thank by you. individual thank you very much yes improvement of the climate change thank, thank you. you so much thank you. My name is Bruni Triolz from Universal Esperanto Association. Till now, I didn't hear any words about the carbon footprint of new technologies. I think four persons of the mission coming from our uh, smartphone and so on. So I should like to know who is ready to make use his own use of smartphone Facebook, Twitter, Sirius. 
prepare this aircraft finally, only two eight two point oh eight percent. Thank you very much. And if we're doing good, we have five minutes left and we have five people, so try to do it in four so that we can have maybe a final five minutes, <laughs> please. My name is Josh Christensen. Uh, my question is this, how can we out-engineer climate change and involve the engineers and minds um, to, to be able to out-engineer this problem? Because current renewable energy solutions are expensive um, to implement and limited by battery technology. Okay. Quick. All right, my name is Dallin Christensen, and my question is, my question is for anybody who wants to answer. The question is, you know, I think we can all agree that climate change is not going to be solved if we don't have a cultural shift. Now, for me, that cultural shift, you know, I started recycling because my mom taught me to, and I still recycle today because I love to care about the environment. So my question is about how we can create that caring about the environment and other people to truly solve the climate crisis. So my question for all of you is how do we plan, you know, as the UN, as people across the world, on implementing that sort of cultural shift? Does that start with family? You guys mentioned influencers, is that your plan? So that's my question. That's Thank a you. good question. Please. Oui, moi je vais parler en français, j'espère qu'il y aura un traducteur. Donc je voulais tout simplement dire pour le changement climatique. I'm sorry, sir. We don't have interpretation. Je voudrais seulement dire pour le changement climatique avec Simply like to say on changing the climate change. que l'Afrique est en train de subir les, 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 les conséquences. Parce que nous assistons à la sécheresse, aux inondations, la déforestation et les déforestations. Which is caused actually by other countries. Donc, j'aimerais que les, les Nations Unies puissent penser à, à ces pays en voie de développement qui luttent aussi euh, pour ce phénomène. I would like the United Nations to deal with this, these problems. Yes. Seulement le problème qui se passe euh, quand les Nations Unies euh, mettent en place à des fonds pour pouvoir accompagner les pays en voie de développement, la société civile est mise de côté. Ok. La société civile est... La société civile. Which is... Oui, moi je représente okay. la société civile. So, they're not included. It's the, the civil society and her group that she belongs to. When United Nations groups go to different events into Africa, they are not included. And that's something that I'm seeing a lot. If we're going to do this together as a world, then we need to include everybody. Parce que c'est une question de politique. Volontaire politique. Donc, ce que je pouvais suggérer, c'est qu'on accompagne l'Afrique, par exemple, à la construction des maisons en terre. So, like construction of houses and things like that in Africa, Mais the companies need to work together with the locals so they make better decisions. Maisons écolo écologiques équipées des énergies renouvelables. All renewable and sustainable ways of doing things. And hydrology. Parce que nous avons des fleuves. Because they have floods. Okay. En Afrique, il y a le soleil, il y a le fond, il y a le I'm sorry, I think I have, I mean, we have to take the other last two and I will not accept additional people, I'm sorry. We want to give the panel the final, final say before we, we do. let's just hear the last two questions and then please, very, very brief. Okay, my, my name is Nathan Mould, my question is just what can we expect impoverished and exploited communities to do and how can we help them? Thank you. How can we change the culture of what we're buying and the different corporations that we're supporting? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. We've had like 15 questions, and I hope that you remember well, some of those that you didn't I, I will. I will. And I, I guess we'll all I will have some closing comments. Yes, exactly. so final closing quotes, and if you can yeah. just touch on those issues. So I know in Utah, we have the Utah Climate Action Network. This is a group of people who come from all sectors of this of the state and in the work that is involved in addressing climate change so it's engineers and scientists it's it's people who are in in public policy it's all of us and if communities would create similar structures 
it does help bring together the ideas that can be shared and implemented. And I know our structure, we are sharing the information that the experts are bringing to the table. So the quicker we can create these networks of people within our own communities, the quicker we can have results and see. The other thing is going back to, you absolutely have to put pressure on businesses and your politicians, your leaders, to do the right thing. And if, if you are not seeing that, then you absolutely have to use your voice, especially in this country where we have this freedom to vote and we need to use that and we need to be informed. We actually have to know not just that somebody wants to do something, but what is their plan? What is their strategy? We have addressed in my administration, transportation, housing, affordable housing, affordable housing that is net zero. We've done three net zero city buildings. You know, we are working as fast and feverishly as we can. And at the end of the day, we have to have other leaders doing the exact same things. You must know who is leading and you must know where they stand and they must have plans. They can't just tell you, I'm gonna move a power plant because I want to. It doesn't work that way. And one last thought is that people in poverty, women are already behind the curveball in these climate change experiences, disasters, and storms, severe storms because the way society is structured is already putting bias on us and our ability to have the same economic opportunities, the same ability to uh, be able to get beyond social structures that have been in place for very long periods of time. We have to, as humans, rise up and help one another and acknowledge that we are in this together and we absolutely have to own the social structures that are quote, the norms that are not serving humanity well and do something about them as we take action on climate change. We must address that. Thank you. So, I'll try to, if I can remember, I'll try to hit a couple of these. Uh, carbon footprint of new technology, someone asked about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think in the past, people haven't done a good job with that. Right? You look at um, uh, the iPhone as, as a perfect example, right? The iPhone was created without actually looking at system design and design for the environment. Mm -hmm. And they had to go back and think about how do we design it better so we can actually reuse some of the materials. They've done a great job since then. But that was a couple of years after it was launched and hundreds of millions sold. Uh, what's going on now is there's a lot more efforts on design for environment. So you're training old engineers how to do design for environment and new engineers that are coming out of universities, so kudos to universities, are, are training people on how to design for the environment where you're designing new technologies up front for how they can be used when they first come out, but also how can they be disassembled. Um, second, one of the other questions that was asked about a cultural shift, I thought it was a fascinating conversation yesterday, someone talked about policy and culture, and how people, um, uh, politicians can create policy. Policy only gets you so far if culture isn't there to back it up. Recycling is an excellent example, there's many examples. But you can have recycling, if no one recycles, it's a moot point. Um, it's a hard thing to do, and I think that's one of the reasons why we talk about a lot of the individual actions. Individual actions are not just about how do you create small actions to deal with a big problem. It's how do you create small actions and specific societies to support the policies that, we, that exist now and that we want to see in the future, because they complement the other. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. If I heard correctly, somebody asked us, what do we recommend all the people that follow us on social media to be part of the climate change action? And it's not that simple. There's so, there's so many people so confused with the information that is going around everywhere. There's so many children and there's so many kids that ask every day, what can I do to help? Where can I go? Do I have to go to a foundation, organization? And what I think and what I recommend always in my social media, in my Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, everything I can have uh, through social media is right now uh, living the, all of this Amazon situation is planetary, donate, 
look in the link of Act Now by um, UN. There's so many ways we can help right now, but through YouTube, for example, I can tell all the children and all the all my followers to maybe change their toothbrush to a bamboo toothbrush, not to take more, not to uh, intake so much meat, uh, the plastic use, no, use uh, metal straws, travel light. I mean, don't travel that much. Um, use your scooter. Use your bike. Stop using so much your car, etc., etc. There are small messages that we can um, bring to all the youth and all the community, all the youth community. <laughs> Sorry, this Spanish and this uh, youth community. And I think Luke does the same. I follow you, and I love all the messages you bring. To all your, your followers, is what I do. Obviously, right now, uh, what Colombia needs the most is that the lungs of the earth come back alive. So, if you can help me with that, please. <laughs> that would be amazing. You. And you guys too. Thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, just to follow up, I, I think um, a couple things. One, the seeing the shift in um, our youth is amazing because uh, for the first time we, we, we've really seen an increase on social media about our environment. Like the, um, the news outlets were not talking about uh, the Amazon fire for two weeks until social media really brought it to light. So it is an incredible tool and as you said before, I think we really need to encourage everyone to use it to spread awareness. Uh, more, more focused on uh, your question, um, how do we cater? So something that I've really worked with over the years of having a social media is catering to my followers. And I'm sure a lot of you out there right now are wondering what I can do like, on my social media to, to get that youth engagement. Something that you have to really think about is who's following you, first of all and what other posts have they really engaged with. So what I've tried to do is I've realized that when I post a picture of a tree, it doesn't get as much engagement as a picture with me uh, either speaking or like, you know, with someone else speaking about the environment. Um, so it's really catering towards what your, your audience is. That's one of the main things that I would stress on if you were wondering what you can do to spread the word of uh, social media so is really thinking about who your audience is and what you can do to tailor your message to them and what they really respond to well. Uh, one last thing just to answer someone, I can't remember who asked it, but someone else's question up there about how do I, how not, how not filled with apathy. Um, it's because I can't. I, I don't think we're in the spot right now to give up. We, we still have an opportunity to turn this around, we have obviously a very short window, but the one message what I said in the opening plenary a lot and emphasize on is hope. The only way we're gonna get anywhere is hope. I mean, the message is lost is we're doing all this for absolutely no reward. So we have to stay hopeful because that's one of the main drivers of this movement is hope. Um, I, I think that's what the youth really bring to this movement is their hope for their world because it's the only thing we have um, in this fight is hope. Um, and obviously with hope comes action, it comes these solutions. So the first step obviously is to not succumb to the negativity, it's just to keep plugging away and keep having that hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let me also start with the social media. I, I think that uh, one thing we should know is that you can't, uh, you can't help somebody to, you know, tell you not to post anything on social media. Everybody has their own way to manage on social media. Uh, one of the things I do mostly is that I don't just follow. I try to read what you do. I go through your profile and see what you do. But the bottom line is that it's an open space. So anything you want to use on social media to do is fine for you. But when we are talking about the issue of climate change, I think one of the tools, we need, we need to start looking at messages that makes people to understand the impact of climate change, what they need to do, and action that is going on around the world, and 
most of the time for me, I also use my social media, not to call out the politicians, but to also send them the solutions. Okay, this, these are the things I think we need to start looking into. Instead of having argument or conversation that doesn't drive to any conclusion. So those are the things I think we start need to talk about. Like I said, hope, start talking about positive things. Leave the negative part of it. Everybody has solution to the Amazon problem today. Start sending those messages. Like I said that before, storytelling is very good. One of the things I uh, want to start doing and start working with infograms. You can do a very simple picture in an infographic way and put it out there. People will understand what you're talking. And most especially, I, I think people always love seeing things in pictures and really love for text. And if you, if you can do a picture of cartoon that can make people to understand how to use those things on like social media. Then let me talk about, uh, somebody talks about uh, um, engineering, you know? There are lots of, I remember some years back in Nigeria we talked about the, uh, the mining issues. They are the mining issues. I think we need to start looking at how we can start using our profession to see the way we can use to solve climate change problems. Rather than for us to be looking at how much am I getting from it. So the solution should come from, our, from, from within and using our profession. So I think uh, how to get to the community, start looking at the tools that you can use to engage your community. If it is French, they can speak, speak French to them. If it is any kind of language, you just need to change your mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. About time, so we will be just be very brief, and then we, we have to end this because I know people have other commitments. Okay, so very briefly, it's not just one individual. There's over seven billion of us in this world, and what that one action that we're doing that contributes to this issue is being done by two billion people, three billion people all over the world. So combine all that energy together, the impact is staggering. So what you're doing individually can help influence others who will join the party. And then the solution and, and what will happen afterwards is what will really help us in this fight. So feel free to pull me over to discuss some of the questions that I'm not able to address right now. But let's keep doing what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's do that. We have one applause. Great. And maybe we can stand together and have a good photo if you want. And then thank you very much for being with us. And thank you to the great panel.